when you're a young manager, the more you actually churn people out, the faster you start learning about people because you're like, oh my God. So when I started, I mean, the first four years I ran this business, I probably let go half of the people I hired in their first year um, because I wasn't good at hiring. Um, But what that meant is I ended up seeing 30, 40 people in a year, right? Where I was able to reflect on like, oh, learn from that, learn from that. Oh, I thought that that person was going to be okay. And then it ended up being amazing. What did I learn from them that I missed in my interview process? So for me, interviewing and building a team, it's a contact sport. Like the more people you meet and see their actual fucking work product, you can't, like everybody's resume sounds the same. Like, you know, you got to work with somebody every day to really understand their freaking work product. And the more of that you get to see, the better you are at knowing who is and isn't going to be right for your team, your working style, your organization and culture. Welcome to SEO Leverage. This is episode 115. And today we're going to talk to Will Reynolds from SEO Interactive. Welcome, Will. Thanks for having me today. Thank you so much for coming to the show. Seer Interactive, your agency definitely has been on my radar for quite a few years already. I've been in SEO 20 years as well. And I remember your agency was definitely one of the leading and is still one of the leading digital marketing agencies working with all the big, all the big names, big brands. Uh, so congrats on that one. I've read you have about 200 team members right now. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. That's, that's definitely impressive, and I want to get get back to you and um, on that topic in particular. But really, first, uh, get a little bit of a feeling uh, of your assessment of the current movements in search marketing. At the time of recording, this is late May 2023. We are in a situation where uh, most people working on the internet, at least, are probably using ChatGPT. We have Bart uh, from Google being the chat version. We have some previews. What search might look like in a few months what's what's your general assessment where things are going i honestly think that it's it's probably the dis- most disruptive thing i've seen in my time in search i mean you know if you've been around long enough you've heard several times that you know seo is dead seo this is going to kill seo that's going to kill seo and it, everybody's been wrong for the freaking 20 years plus they've been saying it right yep this is the first time that if seo is defined very narrowly as where do I rank on a search engine? Um, again, it's far from freaking dead. It's like, you know, I still believe that let's just say we get to a world in the next, let's say six years from now, 50% of people are using some kind of search generative experience or something like that. That's still billions of freaking searches every year that are going to traditional Google. So I, I don't think it's like you're out of a job. Um, what I think more of is, um, you know, the pie might be a little bit smaller, but it's still a pretty big pie, right? But I think that as an agency, you know, my responsibility to my clients is to help them to make wise decisions about what that split kind of looks like and where to make investments. And that's where I'm mostly focused on is how do you know when to time it right? Because let's be honest, like in terms of the disruption, you need customers to be using chat GPT, you know, Google, uh, Google's Bard, uh, Bing's chat search. And right now we don't have good data on that, you know? So the last thing you want to do is have your client jump all in on something to find out that their customers aren't there yet. So that's where I'm starting is like trying to put my head around where can I get the data that'll help me to better consult my clients. Now on the flip side, you know, that's the searcher experience. Then you've got things like content generation. And we can talk about that separately, but like the ability to build content and things of that nature is another area that's going to be highly disruptive, I think, for folks in the the organic search side. Do you think you're going to have 200 team members a year from now? Yeah. Like I don't, I don't use, I don't use automation to try to lower my headcount, right? Um, I'd rather use the automation to lower my price point and to lower my price point to use those efficiencies could actually help me to grow as a result, not hire fewer people or have fewer people. A hundred percent agree. We do the same thing. We actually try to increase the deliverables with the same team or a growing team, uh, just leveraging the new possibilities, which are definitely absolutely in a, on a different level. Um, I like that you did you look at at where 
tangible data can come from. We're in a situation where really every single week, literally, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a market as well, uh, just before this call, and we, we just said we're in a, in a world where this week it, there are different possibilities than next week, and it's it's moving that fast. But it also means that you never have trusted experience or experience you can trust. You don't have data points really. You don't know how search users are going to react right now. It's pretty much SEOs evaluating what's happening. And we probably have a very <laughs> a biased way of assessing things as well. The average user might react very, very differently. Um, so it's all it's all growing. What I do th see on my end is like a, a, a growing need for branding, I think, in search marketing in general, because Google just needs to be educated more around the brand and, and really understand what the brand actually stands for rather than having a specific article. But it's definitely going to be interesting to see uh, where tangible data comes from to make some some more educated decisions yeah this is this is like you said it, it, it's such a pace of change and it's so new so to me that's always exciting like i remember when i first got into seo it was so new that it didn't matter that i was fucking 22 years old right <laughs> people had to listen to what i had to say because i knew more than they did right and like to me, if I was in, if I was in my twenties right now, I'd be like, this is the reset. All those old guys that go around talking about, I've been in search for 20 years. That has nothing to do with your ability to think through how to use chat GPT, how to use these tools um, to revolutionize the way that we deliver services for our clients and help people to discover answers. So if I was in my mid, if I was in my mid twenties, I'd be like, I needed this opportunity and I'm going to lean in so hard because I could be one of the first thousand, fifteen hundred people that's really pressing this technology. Um, now, I'm not going to give up the crown that easily, my damn self. So you better believe I'm not just going to give up my, you know, get, you say, oh, let the young guys have it. Like, no, I want to get in the no. arena and I want to duke it out <laughs> with them. Right. But to me, I remember being 22, 23 and watching my friends learning to like, you know, they were trying to learn how do I impress my boss so I can get a fucking promotion. And I was like, I'm just going to be really good at this thing that I'm learning. And then it shouldn't freaking matter. Right. Um, so, yeah, to me, it's a massive reset. And I'm super stoked to see who kind of rises up at this time. It's absolutely really, really impressive. I want to go back to to your team. So I want to, to walk you a little bit back to when, when you started out. Uh, I imagine you also started out as a one-man show at some point. How did you go about building your team? Did you always have a really big team in mind? I mean, 200 people are crazy. We have 30 people here. Um, and I, I can imagine probably 50, but still have a hard time wrapping my, heart, my head around a bigger team. How did you go about growing so big? Well, I didn't want to. Um, we didn't take on any new business. Like we took on, let's just, I'm not going to say any because that would be uh, a falsehood. I'd say that we maybe only took on 10% of the clients that approached us once we got to a certain size. Um, so I didn't want to get over like 10 people. So therefore we spent a good like year, year and a half just saying no to almost every opportunity that came to us. Cause I didn't want to get big. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, well, how did you go from telling? And I would tell the team that like, it would literally be like, guys, we're not going to be over 10 people. That's not my vision. Yada, yada, yada. So I knew I didn't want to win by myself. I think winning by yourself is boring. I think when you're in an industry that's constantly changing, it's one thing to have like a mastermind group it's another thing to have people that you're sitting around and talking to and conversing with eight hours a day all the time, right? Not a once a week mastermind group, right? So I, I like winning with a team. I like the concept of, yeah, I could be really smart by myself, but you added something in that I never would have thought of. And now the thing that I started with is made better because we work together. So I knew I never wanted to be a solo consultant um, because I find it extremely freaking boring to have nobody to high five um, when, when you create victories for clients. Um, I also find it much more fun to help somebody else to grow, um, than just to have me just do well on my own. So, um, I didn't want to be big, but I wanted to, I knew I wanted to have a team. So what ended up happening for me was I started realizing that people had been with me, let's say it's been three or four years at this point, And we're kind of stopping our growth, uh, intentionally, uh, so that we don't get too big. And then I started bringing in another person and another, and the team would be like, yo, you said we weren't going to get over 10. Why are we at 12? Why are we at 13? And it was because we were turning away so much business that um, 
I knew we had enough work to take on the additional team members. And I was meeting really cool people I wanted to work with. So for me, I think I wanted to grow because I kept meeting new people that were doing really cool things that I wanted a chance to learn from and work with. And that's how I kind of got over my artificial um, limit of not wanting to get over um, 10 people. And then I also realized that if you don't grow, you're going to have team members and it's fine if this is your business model, but you have to be honest about that model. If you're not growing, you're probably not creating chaos in the company. And if you're not creating chaos in the company, there are fewer opportunities for people in your company to grow and to spread their wings and to take on new challenges. So if you keep the company a certain size, you know, it's harder to find new challenges for your people that have been with you for three, four or five years. And they might move on because they're like, hey, I got really good at search, but now I want to try this other thing and you're not really growing the business. So therefore, I got to go somewhere else to expand my knowledge. I think that's it. Quite a, quite a few points I really, really like. So definitely winning with the team. We have the situation uh, here as well. I, I intentionally, I, I remember I had a physical office before. We're now all working remote. And I, I, had, I prepared it. We, we refurbished it. We prepared it for seven seats because I wanted to have seven people in my team sitting in the same office doing the same thing. Uh, so this was pretty much the idea from the beginning. And then we, we just started adding more people as we just uh, started to grow as well. So we have uh, an amazing client base as well. And then I would love to have a coffee and uh, or, or, or meet every single client in person because we're just working with amazing people right now. So I can very much relate to, to your story, but I can also relate to this, this kind of chaos necessary for growth. When I, when I look at the last team meetings we had where we were talking all about AI and how is this going, how we are going to do this differently in the future and, and that other thing, etc. You can almost feel like everybody's head smoking after those meetings, but you definitely also know that the week afterwards, everybody is going to have gone through like their own growth journey on how they're going to embrace this new thing and 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 finding their role. You suddenly have people taking initiative of uh, and saying, okay, I'm going to see how we do keyword research in the future with AI now. And then the other person saying, okay, we are going to be much smarter about link building. Let me let me do this thing. And you see those people taking like leadership in the in the growth journey. And this is a beautiful thing to watch, even with a smaller team like mine. Uh, but obviously with 200 people, this is definitely something I can imagine is an impressive experience as well. Well, I think with 200 people, there's just more change management, right? So actually, you know, uh, there's a, a nimbleness that you have at your size that I don't necessarily have. Um, you know, I got to get people on board. Like I remember back in the day, you used to get a bunch of people in a room, boom, new way of doing something like let's go at 200 people, you know, you got to kind of go through group by group by group and show them a new reality and brainstorm with them. And like, you know, if you've got a bunch of people that are client services, let's just say, you know, you're looking at them and saying, how can you use these tools to do your job better? Mm -hmm. And then you look at your BD team and you're saying, how can you use these tools to do your job better? So that the client experience throughout their journey at SEER is, oh, when I talked to the sales team, they were, they were looking for things like this. They were asking ChatGPT to explain my business back to them in this kind of way so they could better understand. You know, then when we started working together, I got I have an account team that's using ChatGPT this way. And then my SEO team is using ChatGPT or BARD this way. And my analytics team is using it this way. So I got to go through all these different divisions to try to get us aligned as an organization. And I'm trying to find the people in my company who are really jumping at it. This is the same advice I give to CEOs when I talk to big company CEOs. I'm like, find your ChatGPT whisperer. You know, find that person in your company that's going to teach you a thing or two or show you new prompts and ways of thinking, um, because to me, they're going to be the most valuable people in an organization. Anybody that's not questioning, wait, with ChatGPT, is this really the thing that I should be doing? Like, you know, it's like you can for the next six months, but a year or two from now, you're going to need a job and you're not sharpening those new skills that are going to be really important for you in the future. Absolutely. Yeah, they definitely need those innovation drivers. Do you think those are, are the people who should then be team leaders? Are those naturally the leaders of a team or uh, can this be any team member on, on a bigger team? I think definitely not. You know, I'm wired that way and I try not to run any teams because you start to realize the bigger your business gets, the more comfortable you are with chaos. Like you can change my job every day and that's exciting to me. Mm -hmm. It's a comfortable place for me because it means I'm on the cutting edge of something and I'm trying to innovate in an area 
I'd say most people are like, can I please get like documentation on how to do my job so I know I'm doing it well, because then I can feel good about myself and the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Whereas for me, I always focused on the super long end state of like, okay, am I creating value for my client? And I'm okay with whatever the freaking job to be done is in between that. But those people are usually, at least in my experience, are not great team leaders because inherently I would be changing process on my team. And they'd be like, you just changed this process like four months ago. And we haven't completely rolled out those changes yet. And you're already changing it again. And it's like, oh shit. So I think that um, I just don't have great empathy for like, oh my God, what does it feel like to constantly be in change? I love that. So that's why I don't think people that lean into that much change are always going to be your best team leaders. Do you think innovation comes in your agency mostly from you or from team members? No, it comes from team members, but it comes from a, well, it's actually a collaborative effort. Like I'm just throwing stuff out, right? Like, hey, 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 I saw this, saw this, saw this. And what you're looking for is the five to 10 people out of a couple hundred that then like lean into that shit. That's what you're looking for. Um, because then when you guys get together, you know, they spent the last week thinking about this stuff. You've been thinking, you've been using the last week to think about this stuff and a lot will come from that. So you don't need a bunch of people um, like that, but you need enough that they're looking in corners and being like, why are we still doing this this way? Why are we still doing this this way? So I'm hoping to get a couple of ambassadors from each team to try to be the people that I work most closely with, to try to figure out how we can create success for our clients. Because also like the team members are the ones closest to the client problems. The people out there innovating, you can be so far away from the day-to-day -day reality of what it's like to deliver the service to the client that your ideas sound good on paper, but they're hard to execute on the day-to-day. -day. So I think it really is a collaboration between innovation and the teams themselves. Interesting. What do you, what do you think about, I mean, I guess with 200 people, quite a few people of those are going to be remote, right? Yeah. yeah. So how do you, how do you go about, about things like team culture, values, things like those? Do you have any, any thoughts, any, anything you do in order to, to, try to foster something like that? You know, well, I'll start off. I'll take a couple steps back. The thing that scares me most about business is when people become names and numbers on spreadsheets mm -hmm. instead of people that got their own dreams for their families, themselves, and whatever. So when I started the business, everybody was in Philly. Then I couldn't get enough talent in Philly to keep up with my growth. And it took me about a good year and a half to be okay opening up a second office. I like to know my people. I like to um, be close to them. Uh, I like them. I sit out in the open. So I like people being able to hear my conversations. They can get a real education on like what it's, what's really happening in the business. I try to have as few meetings as possible in private rooms so that the people around me can kind of understand what's happening in the business. We used to change where everybody sits every year. So they'd be sitting around different executives and stuff, and they'd be able to hear all kinds of things happening in the business so that we can, um, so there's just more transparency straight up. So um When I opened my San Diego office, um, I basically relocated like, you know, eight people that had been with me for multiple years and was like, I'll pay for you to go out there and open it up. Because then I knew it would be kind of serious culture um, to get things started and kicked off there um, the right way. And then um, what ended up happening is I started hiring people remote that uh, used to work here. And my president, the uh, person that really runs the company, Crystal, she was like, you keep hiring people that used to work here remote, but we don't have a remote policy. Um Because I was like, oh, we used to work together. We did dope shit. Like, let's get them back. Let's get them back. Like, let's just work with them wherever they are because I know they're great, right? Like when you find somebody that you know is great and, um, and they strive for greatness, you're like, I don't care where you are because I know that you strive for greatness when you wake up every day. And I was bringing in all these alumni that Crystal was like, we need a policy. So I think around 2000, probably 18. I started blogging a bit about like our journey to um, going remote. I think that we had uh, at one point we had probably about 20% of the company was remote. And the way that I used to do it um, was if we hired you and you were remote in your first year, we bought you three flights that you had to go to one of our headquarters three times in your first year, whenever you wanted to, you didn't have to try to come up with a client excuse or something. You could just, whenever you felt a little disconnected, you could just fly out and, um, and see people in the team and get to know them. Um, We had apartments in all the cities that we were located in so that people could just kind of come and when they wanted to, when it's a fixed cost and you run a business, it's a lot easier to stomach it than paying for hotel rooms each time. Yeah. And that's how we kind of got our, our remote um, journey started today. I mean, like it's, we're, we're mostly remote and I think that I am, it's like, it's like a, it's like a, it's a necessity. 
right? It's like, you know, I, my clients deserve for me to go out to the marketplace and get the best talent that I can get. But I'd be lying if I said it wasn't, it wasn't hard. It's, it's not hard sometimes um, because I get energy from knowing who the fuck I work with. A lot of, a lot of founders get energy from making money. And I went to school to be a teacher, right? So it's like, my energy doesn't come from looking at my bank account. It comes from working with people and watching them grow in the same way. When I was a teacher, it was fun to watch people learn and grow. So I'm leaning into this, but I'm trying to find my own ways to stay connected. And I think that Sears has been very vocal about what our values are as a company and our impact on community. So as a result, I think we attract a different type of person. And that person is like, all right, like I'm down with what these guys are trying to do in the world. So that's kind of how we remote wise try to continue to instill that culture. And we've got a person whose full-time job it pretty much is, is to make sure that we are impacting communities for our um, coworkers, whether they're remote or in person. So we are getting all different types of backpack drives and clothing drives and days where we all go and pick up trash wherever we are across the country um, to try to find some way to try to spark some of that culture that we've, that we've had when we were in person still as we are, as we're leaning into remote. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love that. It's interesting. I, I hear from other CEOs as well, as well very often where they say, like, I, I need somebody who I can just plug into my company and they are then going to, to do their job. We have always been been more on the opposite side and I spend a lot of time with every single team member still with, with 30 people when they, when they come and they're going to have a daily call with me. And it's probably, pro- in our case, probably me mostly, first of all, trying to, to explain what we do and why we do it. First and foremost, why we do it, what, uh, what we think uh, should be the value that we bring here and then try to to have our strategies which are usually like in between me probably operations and and the rest of the team try, try to to pass this on but it's a lot of meetings a lot of conversations a lot of communication to actually drive this forward but i love that you have built a, a culture where people pretty much when they when they apply already already know what this is going to be about or what the values probably are going to be about yeah it's it's it's, it's pretty obvious when they join as to what we're what we're all about a couple of more questions if if you still have have a little bit more time for us what do you think a good hiring process should look like and i want you to think a lot about about more smaller teams and most of of people listening here might have five ten people maybe at some point uh, but are still very often struggling in the hit is all the time and they share our process very often and what do you think a good hiring process should look like i have no idea um i was never good at hiring i know this is very not um I think Zuckerberg said this and caught a lot of heat, but like I blogged about it. So I'm out there with it. Like I've never been good at hiring. I think I'm, I'm very introspective and I'm kind of hard on myself. So I think when I was younger and smaller, um, I, if somebody said they worked hard, I used my version of working hard as like, Oh, so they work like this or, Oh, like, you know, I'm innovative or, Oh, you know, um, I am a, a lifelong learner, you know, people, Oh, I like to learn, you know, I'm like, Oh, great. That means like, I read a book every month. Like I'm trying to learn about that. And for somebody else that might mean, you know, I found a new way to pick my nose. I don't know. So I was bad at hiring early in my career. And also like, it's easy to mistake mediocrity for excellence when you have a very limited view of what's in the marketplace. Like, if you haven't worked around, so that's one of the, I've not talked about this yet because I'm trying to find a way to write about it in a way that people don't get all butt hurt. But it's like when you're a young manager, the more you actually churn people out, the faster you start learning about people because you're like, oh my God. So when I started, I mean, the first four years I ran this business, I probably let go half of the people I hired in their first year um, because I wasn't good at hiring. Um, but what that meant is I ended up seeing 30, 40 people in a year right? Where I was able to reflect on like, oh, learn from that, learn from that. Oh, I thought that that person was going to be okay. And then it ended up being amazing. What did I learn from them that I missed in my interview process? So for me, interviewing and building a team, it's a contact sport. Like the more people you meet and see their actual fucking work product, you can't, like everybody's resume sounds the same. Like, yeah. you know, you got to work with somebody every day to really understand their freaking work product. And the more of that you get to see, the better you are at knowing who is and isn't going to be right for your team, your working style, your organization and culture. Right. I, I'd absolutely agree. I don't, I don't give too much on, on resumes here myself. Um, I probably. Should. Or even interviews, yeah. interviews. It's all a waste. Like I used to um, hire. So that's one thing I used to do is once I realized I was bad at hiring, um, 
I then started doing group interviews for a while and it was very kind of not, I don't know what the word to say is, but it was kind of like, Oh, group interviews. Like it was like, well, one, I had to maximize my time and two, nothing's easier to be able to ascertain talent than giving people a project to work on real time and present it to you. And, and we would do it in groups. We'd be like, okay, uh, you know, group A, group B, group C, group D, all y'all are interviewing for this job or these two or three jobs we have open. Um, here's the project. You got 45 minutes to put it together, go. And I remember one of my best hires came from that. And she's still with me today after about 10 years, because what we noticed is she could figure out the time, the pressure around like, oh, this has got to be presentable in a certain amount of time. And we're not putting the, our ideas on paper or on our slide decks fast enough. And you could watch her command of the room. And when she got up to present, she made everybody else instantly look like they didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> and if I had a spent, think about the time it would have taken me as a small business operator to try to interview those 20 people, to sit down with all them and go over their resumes, to have them kind of go to round two and round three. I was able to make my hiring decision instantly because I was able to compare in real time how Teresa presented against these other 19 people. And in real time, you're not having to look back at your notes. You're just like, wow, that person that went up first looked great until Teresa came along and smoked them, right? But you got to give people something, at least for me, that's like a work product. So you can see how they actually work and how they then present and connect their thoughts. And then to have that in a bunch of notes. And for me to try to recall that later was a complete waste of time because I was going to not recall it well. I wasn't going to remember it well. And then like, here I am four weeks later trying to remember what you did four weeks ago. Group interviews were great for me early days. Great for me. It reminds me of, of my first hire, which I thought was a great employee for two years until the second one came. <laughs> and I kind of realized that this is not, it's not all as, as I actually expected. And now, obviously, at some point, is, as, as soon as you see people work, like you say, as soon as you see them work, you kind of get a feeling of what what is actually possible and what you can expect, what you can't expect. Um, and we, we definitely are very big on sample tasks. So I think the, the, my most important focus in the interview process is to filter out whoever was lying on the resume. So you have been doing <laughs> SEO for eight years. I ask you a couple of questions and I'm going to figure out. Uh, and I, I try to do this by email before we actually get on a call and then we have a sample task and then uh, we talk about it and we definitely know. Um, but I think this is probably most of what we do. We kind of search chemistry and filter out the liars and then we give them a job as soon as possible and, and see what they can actually do. I'll tell you one thing though, that's uh, a downside of, of sometimes you can, like, like you said, you hired person one thought they were great, hired person two and was like, oh shit, this person, this person, <laughs> person one wasn't as good as I thought. The problem is if person two is like a unicorn and yeah. in my years, that's been something I've had to learn as well as we grew, which is sometimes you get a person that is able to kind of do so many different things well that you then have to say, like, so then you start believing that those people exist in the marketplace. You just got to yeah. go find them. It's a good point. And then you start looking for them and you think you find them. And then they come in and you're like, you're not like them. You're not like them. You're like, damn, I just hired five more people that I thought were like that. Why can't I find someone? And you have to reflect on, oh shit, you know, that person's a unicorn. They can hop out of a meeting about ChatGPT, jump into a finance meeting and then jump into a client fire. And they're just like, I got it. I got it. I got it. And they come out with it really strong, well-delivered, et cetera. And you just got to be like, that person's a unicorn. Let me not try to go and replicate that unicorn activity. I've done that a few times in my career and it's really come back to bite me where I've surrounded myself with a, um, a group of kind of unicorn style people. And then when we went to go and, and, and expand that outside. It was like, no, you know, some people just get so into solving a problem that everything else melts away. Yeah. And, and, and I think that those people are really hard to find. And then you don't want to hold the rest of your team up to that. You want to try to find scalable ways that those other team members can get close to that greatness without having to work and think the same way. That's, that's the like, challenge. And that's the fun, right? It's like, okay, well, I can go and try to find these unicorns, which will be nearly impossible. Um, or I can try to find a way to say, how can I take a person and take this kind of unicorn thinker and turn them into somebody that thinks in terms of scale and leveling up other people to be like them? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I, I was just reminded of something my 
my mentor said at some point, and he said a good business is going to have those unicorns, but it's only going to have the it's also going to have the bus drivers who are very happy doing the same thing, very good and very very well every single day. The same thing are responsible for this particular part of the business. They are not looking at at being those unicorns and being good at everything, but they're extremely good at what they're doing. And this is something that kind of stuck with me. Mm -hmm. where it's like, you definitely have those unicorns. You can plug them into whatever team and they're going to excel. But then you have people who pretty much maintain the system. You can rely on them. They're going to stick with you for years. They're going to be loyal. They're going to grow within their role. But they're not even interested in in like going much beyond because they just love what they're doing and they see they add value this way. You know what? That's um, I, I learned that lesson too. So I remember I reflected once. When like, so when somebody gets promoted at Sear, you know, there was all this like, you know, all this like hoopla, like, oh, this person got promoted, big, big, big shout out and all that stuff. A um, lot of attention paid. But then if somebody stayed in the same job, kicking ass for another year, it was like, eh, you know, and I was like, oh, that's interesting culturally how, you know, um, think about it. What do you get? You, you don't, think about the kudos you get when you get a new job on LinkedIn versus when you just stayed at your same job for another year. As yeah. humans, we're wired for that, like, oh, you got a new thing, change, great, congrats, right? You stay at your same job for six years. It's like, wow, are you kind of complacent? Are you not moving? And, you know, so I kind of, um, I, I looked at my own company and said, oh, look at how much kudos were given to somebody who gets promoted that's been with us for eight months, but somebody that's been in the same role for six years, what do we got for them? And that's when I decided to start to have MVP dinners um, for people who chose to stay in the same role. It's like, cause so often people get promoted. It's like, oh, you know, let's get, let's get time with them with Will. Let's have them explain like what they've been working on and why we saw the promotion and you would have all this. And I'm like, wait, what about the people who made it possible for those people to get promoted who are so good at their jobs that they help other people to get their promotions? And what about the self-confidence to say, I'm really happy where I am doing what I'm doing and adding the value that I add, but yet societally and within a lot of our companies as we're growing, we kind of forget that like, Oh, those people are sometimes more valuable <laughs> because they're not in your office every two weeks talking about their promotion plan, right? Mm -hmm. They're very happy doing what they're doing. And I think they're very easy to ignore. So that's why we systemically created some things in our company to get those folks together on a regular cadence pre-pandemic, we'll have to figure it out post-pandemic to just be like, you're not forgotten here. Like you're at your sixth year in the same role. And we appreciate you for that. And we're going to spend a weekend or, you know, the next two, three days brainstorming with you, working with you mm -hmm. and not giving you that pressure of like, oh, what's next for you? They're like doing my same job. I really enjoy it. And I think sometimes <laughs> that pressure that managers can put on people to be like, well, I'm a manager. I got promoted three times into this role. What's next for you? Sometimes people are like, well, I guess it's not good enough for me to be happy in the job that I'm doing well. And you got to be careful of signaling that as a manager too. Absolutely. I remember one conversation I had early on with a team member that has been have been doing the same thing for a while, and it's definitely not something I could I could actually imagine because I'm always trying to do something new. Um, and and I was like, yeah, what other department, what other division in our agency would you like to get into, etc. And he was like, no, I'm I'm really happy with where I am, and and he's doing an, an amazing job. He's he's pretty much involved in every single project in his role. And uh, I really appreciate it for him. I just say, look, I'm not going to bother you anymore. If you love what you're doing, please stay here. If whenever at some point you get bored, let me know. But I love you for what you're doing here. And it's amazing to be able to rely on those people. So it's it's really interesting how you how you definitely need to to still show obviously those people that they are valued for what they what they're doing and give them a shout out. And and yeah, definitely the promotions get a lot of attention, but it's short term. Short-term attention. And I'll, even, I'll, I'll even challenge you. I'll challenge you on that. Um, I think you got to put a reminder in your calendar every like six months to check in with them because sometimes those folks, they may not even know how to approach you about like, hey, I'm kind of ready to do my next thing. I know I've been in this role for five years, so I don't leave it up to them. Like when I was smaller, um, I would not leave it up to them to hit me up. I, I would tell them, is it okay for me to check in every six months? We'll go out for beers. We'll go out for breakfast. We'll do something. We'll go for a run. I don't care what it is. And if you want to bring up something that's related to your career growth, great. If not, we're just going to have beers, catch up, learn about your family, what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. We don't have to talk about work. And I found that those were some of my most valuable meetings because otherwise people can feel like they're not valued and you value them a ton, but you're waiting for them to approach you to say like, Hey, here's the next yeah. thing that I want. And it's like, well, is that how I get your time? And it's like, Nope, let me just at least 
for me as we got bigger and I couldn't just spend time with every employee, it was really important for me to, um, to put some systemic things in place or otherwise just the day-to-day of the business can have you um, not following through on, on, that, on those promises to those, um, those team members. Absolutely. A hundred percent agree. Appreciate the, the piece of advice here as well. Uh, well, this was really great. I think it's such an, such an inspiring uh, conversation, obviously leveraging your amazing experience with your big team here and, and as an, as a fellow SEO as well, I uh, really appreciate you spending the time with me. If somebody wants to reach out to you, get in touch with you, I know you, you've got a great YouTube channel. I uh, definitely recommend everybody to follow your work and, and what you're doing online. What is the best way to get hold of you or get in touch with you? I'd say, uh, you know, still use the old Google and uh, Google me and, uh, you know, you'll find my YouTube, you'll find my Medium. I think on Medium, it's been a while since I posted anything on Medium, but I, I want to get back into it um, because I really post, tried to post things about the entrepreneurial journey. Mm-hmm. So if you, um, if you go to my old blog, I mean, there's things, I have blog posts from running this business that are probably 15, 16 years old, and they're really great to reflect on and look back at. Like at one point, one of our team members did outreach to Moz asking for a link. And I was like, oh my God, like, what did you do? And I like, I wrote the whole thing about like how it felt to start to scale a business and have cracks like that showing up where you're just like, like, I speak at that conference. Like, what are you doing? Like, what? how is our process so jacked that you're reaching out to somebody I have a relationship with, right? Um, and I wrote the whole blog post on how it felt to run a business that scaled and, you know, and you watch the cracks in your own business and, 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 the, and the pain from that. So I've been writing about this stuff uh, and the growth of the team probably for 15, 16 years. So if people go really far back, either on my medium or on my willreynolds.com uh, site, you can really kind of see the throes of going from probably 25 to 200 plus um, over the over the years. Awesome. That's amazing. Thank you very much for your time, Will Reynolds. It's been very nice to, to talk to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Have a great day. Thank you.